Welcome to BTI, that's Bible Training Institute. We open the scriptures every week, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Study with us and learn how to know God as a close, intimate, and personal friend, and learn what is soon to come upon this world. 31, yes, Acts 17, verse 31. Would you read verse 31 for us, Sister Minnie, please? Because he has appointed a day. Now stop for a moment. He have appointed a what? A day in which, now what does appointed mean? Selected. He has selected a day in which what? He will do what? So here is a day of judgment for the entire world. So as we look at this, we can see that a day is, was selected. Now I want to ask you a question. How do we know that that day that he selected would never be changed? Let's continue. So he's given assurance that he's going to judge this world by Jesus Christ. What event gave us assurance that he would judge the world? Continue. And that he had raised him from the dead. So what event confirmed the day of judgment? The resurrection. the resurrection. Now, if a man rejects the judgment, guess what he has to reject? The resurrection. And if he rejects the resurrection, Paul said, Every evangelical, I don't care whether the man is seven or not, anyone who claims to believe in, in, in salvation, he knows that the resurrection, everything is based on. The Apostle Paul says that if there's no resurrection of all men, we're most miserable. If, 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 of, if of all we have in this life, and we're treated bad and messed up and injustice, inequality, terribleness, oppression, and all of a sudden we die and that's it, then brother, sister, <laughs> we're, all, we're most miserable. But he said, look, after the judgment, there's going to be, guess what, a resurrection. A resurrection of life and a resurrection of damnation. A resurrection in which all things will be made right in the judgment. And so my brothers and my sisters, the Bible tells us then that this appointed day was set. Now my question is, how do we know that it's 1844? Now we know the Bible is clear there's a day in which he's going to judge the world. The Bible is clear on that. But the Bible didn't just say in that verse that it was going to be in 1844. But you told me 1844. I think we should be hard on today, Brother Bill. Because we've been studying this for a little while now. We've got we to get hard on you now and press you. Now, how do you know that it's 1844? Is there a verse, if you had only one verse in the Bible, if you had only one verse in the Bible that you could look at to determine that there was a day of judgment, a day, what verse would you look at? Revelation. Daniel. You said Revelation? You said Revelation? Where would you go in Revelation? Now, that's a good one, but that, that won't tell us a day. And that's very good, though. Very good, good, very good, very good text. What day? What, what verse? I heard somebody say, I heard somebody whisper, Daniel. Daniel. Who, who else? Who, who else want to help? Daniel 8. Daniel 8. Now, you, can't, I'm a, you have to be quiet now. <laughs> Daniel 8. Who, what else? Verse what? 14. Yes. Yes. That's my sister. Now, Daniel 8, 14. What does it say? Let's all say it together. What does it say? And he said unto me. Until 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. I love to hear that in the church. I mean, I'm excited. You know, this is the message that gave us our identity. This is our foundation. We're getting our identity because the devil tried to steal it because he knows that if somebody understands what Seventh-day Adventism is, he's in trouble. This is the message. This is present true. Now, what we're talking about is the first angel's message, Revelation 14, 6 and 7. That angel that flew through the midst of heaven which is the messenger that represents the people of God, represents us who have a message. And he said, when he went to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, what did he say? Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Question, did the apostles preach that message? Yes. No. They couldn't have preached it. In fact, let's, let, let me show you what the apostles preached. Go to Acts. We're in Acts already. So go to Acts 24. Let me show you what the apostles preached. Acts 24. They knew about the judgment. All of them preached about the judgment, but none of them preached this message. And Acts chapter 24, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 24. Acts 24, verse 24. Would you read that for us, Sister Davis? Acts 24 and verse 24. So he was getting ready to tell him, what's the faith of Jesus? What's your message? And so he tells him his message. Let's continue. The message of Christ. Verse 25. And as he reasoned of so what was he teaching? 
He was teaching about righteousness. That's God's message. Let's continue. What's he teaching? Temperance. You know, this message of temperance and health, that's God's message. What else was he teaching? Talk to me. Now, notice what he preached. He preached judgment, what? To come. What does that mean? He said there's going to be a judgment in the future, but he did not preach the hour of his judgment, what? Why could he not preach it? Because it would not have been true. Because the hour of God's judgment had not come. God had appointed a day in which he would judge the world, in which the people who preach it presently would say the judgment is about to take place and is going on when? Right now. Now, and then the only way to know who it is that preaches that message, the apostles didn't do it. The reformers didn't do it. Luther said the judgment is not for about 300 years from, from my day. That's what Luther said. And he's right. In that, as we study more, you'll find out. But anyway, so, so he didn't preach it. He put it far away. But now, listen, there came a group of people that started preaching. The hour of his judgment is come. You know that little group of people? They, they came from the Catholic Church. They came from the Methodist Church. They came from the Baptist Church. They came from all these different churches. And they were then kicked out of their churches. And they were given a name. Anybody know what the name was? Adventists. Not seven Adventists yet. But Adventists. They were all Adventists. And they started preaching. Now, what does Advent mean? What does it mean? Coming. It's a Latin word that means coming. So they all were believing in the special, personal, uh, imminent coming of Jesus Christ. We're talking about a bell and a pomegranate. We know... That this time of judgment, God seated on his throne to judge what? The world. Open the book of records. We'll come back to that. It decides the eternal destiny. October 22nd, 1844. But something happened. Miller and his associates preached this. They preached it based on Daniel 8, 14. They used that text. They preached it based on Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Six and seven. They used those texts. And they went through the prophecies and they showed it without a shadow of a doubt. And we're going to show you a lot of things they showed you. But when they did that, something happened. They believed that Jesus was coming. And you know what they said? They believed he was coming because they believed October 22nd, 1844 was the day of. They believed it. And they preached it. And they believed that because of that, Jesus was coming. But what happened to them? They were disappointed. Can you imagine if you have given up your job? You gave up your house. You sold your business. You sold every material you had. Some, there was a story about a man. Listen, there's a story about a man. He was telling his neighbors, I believe Jesus is coming. They said, well, if you believe it, you're a farmer. You put some potatoes in, you know, in October, fall, this time for potatoes and all that. So they said, you put your potatoes in the, in the ground. If you don't believe it, then, then don't harvest it. Just leave it in there. And then you know everything's going. They said, look, you do that, you, we believe you. That man said, I don't even worry about that. And he, all of his equipment gone. He said, I'm not even going to pick up, uh, get my potatoes. I don't, he said, where I'm going, I won't be needing potatoes anymore. Praise the Lord! <laughs> he said, look, I'm going to sit down at the welcome table. Potatoes? No, sir. I've got something better. Now, she says, now, can you imagine? In October 22nd, 1844, what do you think he felt like? He felt like a baby. He started crying. They said, they have taken away my Lord. I know not where they have left him. Can you imagine what you have felt like? You've been telling everybody this. It was known in history as the great what? Disappointment. Disappointment. Now, I want to ask you a question. This great disappointment, you do know why they were disappointed? Because the day of judgment did begin. They simply did not understand the nature of the judgment. Will they not understand? The nature of the judgment. Let's read this together. Great Controversy 4.9. It says, the scripture, which above how much all others, had been both the foundation and the central pillar of what faith? Talk to me, somebody. The Advent faith, what scripture was it? Was the decoration in Daniel 8, 14. Until 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be what? These have been familiar words to all believers, even the children. And the Lord's soon coming. It says, by the lips of what? Thousands. Was this prophecy repeated as the watchword of their faith? All felt that upon the events therein foretold, depended on their brightest expectations and most what? cherished hope and so when it didn't happen the way they thought they were broken hearted disappointed and the disappointment was not small it was what great. now another time we come together we want to study something called the great disappointment and we're going to see there are three great disappointments two in the past one more to come now grand ascension of the miller tabernacle all through the newspaper they started joking on the millerites and went to all the people they said oh here's the devil holding some people down why didn't you go up was the devil holding you down they're laughing, scoffing. Miller, in the great disappointment, let out. 
heart hurt. Most of those Adventists, after being so solemnly convicted, and that's that Advent that finger. I told you about that finger, right? That's the Advent finger right there. When you see that finger go up, buddy, you better watch out. And so when he came up, the prophecies now, everybody's upturned head, solemn in their conviction. But when that happened, you know, on October 23rd, they didn't start laughing immediately. If you ever heard an Adventist preach, you wouldn't laugh immediately. When those Adventists preached, they were trembling in their seats. And so they waited. 23rd, they said, look, they may have been off by a few hours. We're not doing nothing. But when a few days passed by, they begin to start thinking everything's all right. And they start laughing and joking. Encyclopedia. The great disappointment in the Millerite movement, remember, is it such thing as a, is it really the Millerite movement? No. Uh-uh. You know what we believe and know what we don't believe. In the Millerite movement, no Adventist called himself a Millerite. Miller didn't call himself a Miller. Never let someone uh, confuse your history. What they were were what? Adventists. And Miller himself was not a Millerite. Miller was an Adventist. And those who believe his message, according to the Bible, became Adventists. That's the religion of the Bible. Was the reaction that followed Baptist preacher William Miller's proclamations that Jesus Christ will return to the earth by what? Here's our same date. We need to be able to go back to the Bible and understand it. What he called the Advent. Not he called. That's what the word means. <laughs> His study of Daniel 8 prophecy during the second great awakening led him to the conclusion that Daniel's cleansing of the sanctuary was the cleansing of the world from what? Sin. Sin when Christ would come and he and many others prepared. But October 22nd, what? 1844 came and they were. This is history. They got the attention of the world. Do you know that, that, that one of the presidents, uh, 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 John Quincy Adams, who was a, f a former president at the time in the, in the 1830s, he had Joseph Wolfe come to the White House. And in Congress, Joseph Wolfe opened up Daniel 8, the prophecy of Daniel 8. In Congress, opened up the prophecies that, uh, under the uh, invitation of the president. And the world heard it. It shook the White House. Then it says, these events paved the way for the Adventists who formed the... We're talking about the, in order to become a seven Adventist and understand our identity, we got to understand this. It says the, they continued that, they, that, that what happened on October 22nd was not Jesus' return, as Miller had thought, but the start of Jesus' what? Final work of atonement, the cleansing and the heavenly sanctuary leading up to the... Now, I want to ask you a question. Here was Miller. Why was there great disappointment? Why was there great disappointment? I could give you a kiss right now. That's my daughter. I'm going to put it on the record. That's my daughter. <laughs> and there's somebody say, oh, he's trying, he pastor trying to kiss me. I, said, I knew he was a mad, bad man, you know. <laughs> but that, that is the nature of the Bible. The nature of the judgment. What God wants us to understand as we look at this is that the reason why they were disappointed is because they did not understand. They thought that judgment meant the world destroyed. Judgment meant, because look, the flood was a judgment and it was destroyed. They thought the second coming of Christ, that's when he's going to separate the sheep and the goats. And most religions teach that. So for a little while, for a little while, before we get to the heart and then uh, of the message, let's look a little bit at the nature of the judgment before we go a little further and let us understand how it works. Now, let's look. The judgment is one judgment, but it has three phases. There's one judgment. How many judgments? One. There's one judgment. This is what the Adventists didn't understand. And still today, the world don't understand this, but you and I need to understand it. There is one judgment, but that one judgment has three phases. Somebody said, what do you mean three phases? Not face, but three phases or three parts. Now, if you were to go to a washing machine, the washing machine has stages in which it works. I don't care how fancy it is or how uh, unfancy it is. There's at least three stages to a washing machine. What's the three stages? Anybody, let me see. If, and we're going to see who does, who washes clothes here. <laughs> what are the three main stages? What's the first stage? Wash. wash. Now, somebody said, well, no, you don't know mine because I have pre-wash and soak wash, and, but it's still wash. <laughs> wash. What else? Rinse. rinse. What else? Spin. spin. That's it. Wash, rinse, spin. Now, what if somebody didn't know anything about washing machines and they saw the, the light come on, boop, wash, and it goes and water comes in and they put the clothes in and all of a sudden it finishes. And then, you know, every time it, before it makes the transition, it stops. Dunk. There's a clear limit to each stage. And once that limit is set, that person, oh, good. And they go in to get their clothes. You say, no. 
What will you tell them? They said, what? But it just, it, it, is it not over yet? It just, it, it, it just said it washed. It's a washing machine. Wash is over. What you, is it over? What would you tell them? There's another stage. All of a sudden, boom, 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 presently. And then next stage comes in. What's the next stage now? Rinse. And all of a sudden, the rinsing is going on. It's going on. And finally, the man's waiting, 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 waiting. 20 minutes has passed by, Brother Bill. And all of a sudden, he finished the, it stops. Doo -doo. Then all of a sudden, he comes down. He's ready to get his clothes again. He gets ready to lift up. And you say to him, what? what? You who know the nature of washing machines. What do you say? No. Say what? It, it just washed. Yeah. Now it's rinsing. What else do I need? You say what? One, One more. more stage. And all of a sudden, boop, 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 it switched to the last stage. What's the last stage? Spin. Yeah. Now, I'm going to come back and tell you this, this story another time. You'll better understand it. But then the spin comes, and then it stops. And when it stops, how does the man think? He, he's, he's not sure now. <laughs> he looks to you. And what do you say? It is finished. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The judgment has three phases. Now, the first phase. Now, what does somebody say? Oh, so there are three different washing machines. Is that right? It's one wash machine with three stages or three phases. The judgment is one, but it has three parts of that one judgment. Yes. Now, I'm going to give you the parts, and then I'm going to prove it from the Bible. Is that all right? Yes. First part, so you can write it down. The first part of the judgment is called the pre-advent judgment. What is it called? Pre-advent pre judgment. Let's say it all together. What is it called? The pre-advent pre judgment. Now, someone says, oh, what is that big word? Oh, it's a small word. What does it mean? What does pre mean? Before. Before. What does advent mean? Coming. Coming. So what is a pre-advent? Before Jesus comes. So what is a pre-advent judgment? A judgment before Jesus comes to this earth. You see, all of the world thought that it was the second coming of Christ that would bring the judgment. And they did not understand that there is a judgment that happens before Jesus comes. Somebody said, well, what about when he comes? We're going to find out there's a part of the judgment that happens when he comes. And that's what most of the world confuses because just like that man watching the washing machine, they don't understand that there's one judge, uh, judgment with three different phases of parts. What is the second part? Now, I'll come back to the Bible and show you that. But what is the second phase of the judgment? The second phase of the judgment is what can be called the millennial judgment. Nowadays, you have people called the millennium, the generation of millennials. You had the great generation, the baby boom generation, the millennial generation. But uh, I'll give you another name for that. The, the millennial judgment, another name for that, we can call it the meeting out judgment. Or the, I'm going to give you one more better, better word. I'm going to call you the sentencing judgment. The what? I'll explain in just a moment. I just want you to have it down. So pre advent judgment, millennial judgment. What does millennial mean anyway? Milli. A thousand. Annium. Annual years, millennium, thousand years. So there is a judgment that's going to take place after Jesus comes and is going to last for how long? A thousand years. That's the millennial judgment. In that judgment, a sentence will be given. We'll come back to that. And then there's the third and final phase. The third and final phase. What's the first phase? What's it called? Pre-advent judgment. It only means a judgment before. Jesus comes the second time. What is millennial judgment? What's the second phase? The millennial judgment. And what does that mean? The judgment during the thousand year period. Then there's a third and final phase. What's the third and final phase? Well, I didn't give it to you yet. <laughs> but it is called the executive judgment. The what? The executive judgment. Someone says that where the executives sit and the CEOs. No, no, no. Execute. Executive judgment. So these are the three phases of one judgment. Let's repeat it one time all together. What's the first phase of the judgment? What does it mean? Bef the judgment before Jesus comes the second time. What is the second phase of the judgment? What is the millennial judgment? The judgment during the thousand year period after Jesus comes. Good. What is the third phase of the judgment? Executive judgment. Now let me give you a Bible for that. How can we find what the Bible says a pre-advent judgment? Let's go to Revelation 14. There are many, many texts, but I'm going to look at Revelation 14. And I'm going to, because we studied this, I'm not going to go into the depth of this. I'm going to put your hands on it so you can clearly go back to your notes and say, I can see it clearly. Revelation 14. Revelation 14 introduces this worldwide judgment that God said he would appoint a day. 
In Revelation 14, verse 6, he talks about going to every nation because it's a worldwide judgment. Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Verse 7, this is the first angel. Let's read verse 7 again together. Verse 7 says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment is come and do what? Now, don't you think it's interesting that along with the judgment, he says, worship him that made what? Heaven. Heaven. Now, why is that so important? Anybody, we know, as we're going to prove, that that judgment started in 1844. Why would he talk about the worship him who made? Who, who, who do you call somebody that made? A creator. So if there's a creator, that means there has to be what? Creation. Why would he be giving a special message about creation in 1844 and just before? Now, think about what happened. There was a man by the name of Charles Darwin. Yes. What, he, what is he known for? What is Jar Charles Darwin known for? What is he known for? Yes. Making people fools. Am I right? <laughs> a fool said in his heart, there he is. No so he's been interested in bringing foolishness upon the world. But now, when, when Charles Darwin, he wrote in, in, in 1859 something called the origin of the species. So what did God do just before he knew the world would be taken over by evolution? He sent a message that will exalt the message of what? Creation. Creation. To try to prepare the world. And those who accepted it, they would have saw the foolishness of that. But let's continue. So the Bible says in verse 7, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Now what happens after the judgment? Look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, And I looked and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud, one sat like unto the what, everybody? Who is the son of man? Who is that? Jesus. Having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp what? What do you do with a sickle? Reap. Why would you reap? Because the harvest is what? Come. Look at verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Thrust in thy sickle and what? Why? For the time is come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is what? Right. And what did Jesus say the harvest represented in Matthew 13? The end of the world. So here is a judgment just before the world ends at the coming of Jesus Christ. So here's a judgment before the world ends, before Jesus comes. Do we see that? Yes or no? Yes. So then the Bible teaches in Revelation 14, the first angel is a pre-advent judgment. That's why Jesus says, behold, I come what? He said, I come quickly and my reward is with me. How could he bring his reward unless he's already investigated, already came up with a decision and now can offer his decision of his sentence? Does that make sense? Yes or no? So we can see that there's a pre-advent judgment. I'm going to give you another name for that pre-advent judgment in just a moment. Now, so we see that from the Bible. But the second phase is called what? Talk to me, somebody. The millennial judgment. Now, where can we get that from the Bible? Because everything we believe should be from the, Bible. we're in an institute called what? BTI, Bible Training, Training Institute. So that everything we believe from the Bible. And isn't it a wonderful thing? Amen. When everything you believe can, can be proven from the word of God. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to make anything up. Seventh Adventism is the religion of the Bible. Look at Revelation 20. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And let's notice now the Bible speaks of the millennium. Someone says, wait a minute. The word millennium is not in the Bible. That's true. But guess what? Millennium only means a thousand years, and that is in the Bible. And so millennium is in the Bible, if you understand. Now look at Revelation 20, and let's pick up in verse 4. Let's pick up in Revelation 20, verse 4, and I want uh, Sister Davis, would you read that for us, please? Revelation 20 and verse 4. And I saw a throne. Now, who's sits on a throne normally? A king. a king. Let's continue. And what happened? And judgment was what? How long? So they were on the thrones judging. They were in the thrones of judgment for how long? The Bible says a thousand years. So then we can call that the thousand year judgment or the millennial judgment. Because millie, annual, 
thousand years. Does it make sense? Yes or no? So we see the Bible. They're not three different judgments. It's one judgment, but it has a pre-advent phase. It has a millennial judgment, a judgment during a thousand years, but then it has the third and final phase. What's the third and final phase? Let's see if we can see that from the Bible. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. The Bible explains this. Everything is in the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 10. And let's notice what the Bible says in Deuteronomy the 10th chapter. And we want to read if uh, Mother Davis, you'll read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 18. What does the Bible say in verse 18? Deuteronomy 10 and verse 18. No, it's all right. Uh, it's all right. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. When you hit Deuteronomy, we're going to chapter 10. We see these three phases. First phase is the pre-advent judgment. Second phase is the millennial judgment. The third phase, the executive judgment. And in Deuteronomy chapter 10, we want to make sure the Bible says what we said so we're not making it up. Deuteronomy 10 verse 18. What does it say, please? He does ex ex execute. He does what? Now, this is love, but the first part says he doth, let's read that together. He doth what? Execute the judgment. So when you make a judgment, the last part is you have to do what? Execute the judgment. Go to the book of Jude, chapter one. All those judgments, Sodom and Gomorrah, the flood. Now, you can see how a person, when you study the judgment, he doesn't know which one you're talking about. Because in the Bible, the Bible used the word judgment for all three of these. So you've got to study it properly so you're not confused. And in 1844, the Seventh-day Adventist Church thought that the judgment in 1844 was going to be the millennial judgment. They thought they were going to be gathered up for the Lord and ever be with him for a thousand years. But that was not that judgment. There was a judgment prior to that. And they did not understand the nature of the judgment. So they were disappointed. Now, let's look at what the Bible says in Jude chapter one. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Now, I want to give you an illustration, and this is just fair. Think about how reasonable it is. In the court of law, these three phases are followed, even today, at least theoretically. Now, let me give you an illustration. Here's a man. He is uh, at a crime. A murder has been committed, and there's a person nearby, and it looks like the evidence points to that man. And so the police go over to him, and they arrest him for probable causes, but they can't convict him yet, can they? No, they can't convict him yet, but they believe. And what they want to do is they want to send in some detectives. They want to gather some witnesses. They want to ask him some what? Questions. We're going to find out that the first part of anything that happens, there has to be an inquiry. There has to be an examination. There has to be a what? Investigation. So we're going to find out that the pre-advent judgment, another name for that is called the what? Investigative judgment. That's the judgment before Jesus comes. Now, if a man were then arrested and he says, I'm innocent, I have an alibi. And others say, no, no, I saw you do it. It goes now to trial. It goes to court. There's a controversy. And so he, they must stand before the judge for a decision to be rendered. And the first part, the judge is coming in and say, this is what's going to happen. The judge now hears the case. Am I right? Yes. And when his case comes up, what happens during the case? There are witnesses. There's a presiding judge. There are advocates, lawyers. There are uh, 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 the, uh, the, 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 the investigators. And during that trial, there's an investigation going on. Let's say all of a sudden inside of the trial, they get enough evidence. And it says, you are guilty. And the evidence convicts them to be guilty. What's the next stage at that point? Do You know, the, the, the courtroom. They don't just immediately do anything. You know what they do next? They go into another part that's called the sentencing. Because a man, if he committed murder, the person may say, the judge may say, well, what he's going to get is life in prison. Or they may decide that he's going to get 40 years in prison with no parole. Or they may say what he's going to get is the death penalty. Electric chair, lethal injection this is a sentencing so you don't do that before the man and it's supposed to be innocent and to prove in what guilty so in this first phase it's supposed to prove who is innocent who is guilty then the second phase goes into the sentencing 
Go to Deuteronomy. We're coming back. I told you to go uh, to Jew, but we'll come back. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 17. We'll get this name down. Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. Notice what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 17. And we want to begin in verse 8. Notice how the judgment works. Deuteronomy 17, talking about the nature of the judgment. Deuteronomy 17 and Sister Minnie, verse 8, please. Deuteronomy 17 and verse 8. Where? In judgment. All right. Between blood and blood, between plea and plea, and between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within thy gates, then shalt thou arise and get thee up into the place which the Lord shall choose. First it says, if, this, if the judgment is too hard, bring it to a place that God has chosen. Talking about Jerusalem into his sanctuary to the priest. Look at verse 9. Now that tells us then the priest was involved in the work of what? Judgment. judgment. Is there a priest in the sanctuary? Yes or no? Yes. And he's involved in the work of what? Judgment. judgment. Now let's watch. Let's continue. Continue. Levites, and into the judge that shall be in those days, and inquire. And now inquire. Now what's inquire mean? Investigate. investigate. So in the judgment first, there's an investigation, an inquiry, a question, examination. Then what? Continue. The sentence. You're not following this thing. This is Bible. So the first part of the judgment, the pre-advent judgment, another name is an inquiry judgment or an investigative judgment. The second phase is a millennial judgment or a sentencing. It's not talking about sentence like, you know, derogatory sentence or it's sentencing, meaning they make a decision of what is going to be meted out. It's a measuring. How much punishment are they going to get? Whatever you meet out, it shall be meet to you again or measured to you again. It's a measuring or sentencing. So the man, he comes in, he's, he's convicted. The evidence says that he's guilty. All of a sudden now the courtroom goes into a, 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 a deliberation inside. They're trying to determine what decision they're going to give. Life, death, 40 years, etc. Now once they make the sentence, is it over? No. Somebody then must do what? Execute. Execute. In other words, if he's going to be 40 years in prison... Somebody must come into that courtroom and they must take him and now put into a, a effect the sentence and take him to prison. Are you following? Right. If it's lethal ejection that the sentence was, then somebody must then take him and put him in and give him the lethal injection. So these are the three phases that happen even today. Am I right or wrong? Yes. And it's fair. And when Jesus comes, go back to Jude now. When Jesus comes the third time, you say the third time? <laughs> I thought the second time, the Jews don't even, I don't believe he came, didn't even believe he came the first time. But three times, the first time he comes, he comes as a what? Lamb. The second time he comes, he comes as what? Uh -uh. He comes as a king. He finished priest when he comes the second time. He, he, he stands up, his priest says over. He comes as a king. Now the third time he comes, just remember when he comes the second time, we're going to go back to heaven with him for how long? A thousand years. But he's going to come back again. When he comes back that third time, guess what he's going to come and do? Execute. He's coming to do what? Execute the judgment that has been made during that thousand year period. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousands ministered. I'll ask you a question. Who do you see first? You see a throne and then you see someone sitting on the throne. Right. What does the Bible call the person sitting on the throne? Ancient the ancient of days. Now my question is, who is that? The Father. God the Father. So now we see, France will come back to this page, but now we see, in the nature of the judgment, the first person we see is a throne. On that throne, the ancient okay. of days is sitting. His head, his hair is like what? Whoa. Whoa. What color is it? White. White. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. You say that that's God the, the Father. Father. And you know what my you know what my next question is. Where is that? Where is that in the Bible? Because we're in Bible Training Institute, right? <laughs> All right. Now see, and there's no way no one's going to say, well, we, we, we believe that it's, it's Advent, it's Advent. No, 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 no. <laughs> Everything we believe should be based where? On the Bible. On the Bible. Now, I hope you love the 
pushing you in this direction. Do you like that? Because yeah. like you're training your mind, and now somebody tells, tells you something, you know what you're saying? You, it, you may be kind to them, you may love and smile with them, but then you're back in your mind, you say, look, give me some Bible. <laughs> give me some Bible, show me from the word of God. Now, I love you, I respect you, but I won't believe you unless you give me some Bible on that. So now, look what the Bible says. Let's go to Ezra. Let's go to Ezra. We, we can't go through a whole, whole in this case. Our time's getting away, and I want to get to a point before we close. But I want to give you something. Now, we want to see something right in that chapter, but I want to give you something else first. Go to Ezra chapter 5. Ezra chapter 5. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. We're going to Ezra chapter 5, and I want you to notice something very carefully as we begin to look at this ancient of what? Day. Day. <laughs> Ancient of days. Let me know when you get there. Amen. All right. And it says here. Uh, let me go back. Let me go back myself first of all. And the Bible is so good. <laughs> Ezra chapter 5, and let's pick up in verse 12 first. Ezra chapter 5, and verse 12. Who will read that for us, please? Who will read that for us? But, a, but after that our fathers had provoked the God of heaven unto wrath, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carry the people away into battle. Now, Kim, keep coming down. And I want you to come down to verse uh, 15. All right. But in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, the same king Cyrus made a decree to build his house of God. And the vessels also of gold and silver of the house of God, which mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that was in Jerusalem, and brought them into the temple of Babylon, those did Cyrus the king take out of the temple of Babylon, and they were delivered unto one whose name was Sheshbazar, whom he had made governor. Now look carefully. Now I want you to look at the very next verse in 15, the first part, where it says, that search be made. And I, I, I told you five, I meant four, excuse me. Four, fifteen. Four, fifteen. That's the four verse. Okay. Right. It says that search may be made in the book of the records of thy fathers. Now stop right there. It says the book of the records of what? Thy father. I want to add something else. Because that father in Daniel chapter 7, it said the judgment was set and the book. books were opened. So we see the setting of books being opened and the fathers. Now jump back to chapter 3. We'll come back to that point. I want to put this together. Go back to chapter 3 for a moment. And look what it says in verse uh, 12. Ezra 3, verse 12, Sister Kia, please. But many of the priests and Levites... Now slow down. And chief of the fathers, who were ancient men... Now you missed it! You missed it! You missed it! You missed it! What did it say? What, what, what did you get? Ancient men. Okay, so the Bible says, ancient of what? Days. But the Bible says that the fathers were what? Ancient, ancient men. men. So then, when you talk about ancient men, who are you talking about? A father. So the ancient of days is speaking of what? The, the father. father. So we know now that the ancient of days is the father. So in the judgment, who is presiding over the judgment? The, the father. father. So he's on the throne first. But then the Bible says in Daniel 7, that, go back to Daniel 7 now. Go to Daniel, hold your thumb in Ezra 4 because we'll come right back to get the setting. We'll go to Daniel 7 and read verse 10. Read verse 10, uh, Sister Kid. Daniel 7, verse 10. We'll put it together. We'll put, see, you can go line upon line, precept upon precept, and the Bible explains itself. Verse 10. A fiery stream went out of the temple of God, and it was times 10,000 stood before him. What happened? The judgment was set. And what happened? And the books what? were opened. So this is a type of judgment in which you have to do what? Open, open books. books. Now, what, when you open the books, what are you doing? You're beginning. 
you're beginning, yes, but you're doing what? Yeah. Studying something. Give me another name for studying. Investing. Investing. So this is beginning to introduce. Now, let, 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 now what, what were these books that are being opened up in the judgment? Now go back to Ezra 4. Let's see what the, the books the fathers had. The, 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 chron the chronicles and all they had. Now go, to, go back to Ezra chapter 4 and we'll get a name for these books now. And we're going to prove this in just a moment. Go, to, and go, to, go back to Ezra 4 and read verse 15 again. We're going to read something saying, I just put books here now, but we're going to put the rest of them. Books, the ancient, of, the ancient of days of the father. Then it says that books were open in the judgment. What were these books? Ezra 4, verse 15. Uh, Sister Debbie, verse 15, please. That search may be made. Go down now. May where? In the book of the records. Of thy what? Of the so there's something that the Father has called the what? The book the of what? Records. So in the judgment, what's being opened up in the judgment? The, the books, books of the records. Now, question. I want to ask you. Is it one book or more than one book? More than one. How do I know it's more than one book? It says book the books. judgment was set and, and, and the books, books were open. So how many books are there? How many books? Now, good question. <laughs> good question. Now, I don't mean how many books for each person, but I mean how many books that carry the entire world's records. Three. Three books? Three books. I was about to say 12. It's, like, it's almost like the, the, the Adventism is starting to come back on that either. I remember we used to talk about some books. Three books. Three books. Three books. Now, there are three books. Three books. What is the first book of record? The first book of record. What's the first book called? Go in your Bible now. Let's go in your Bible. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, let's see if we can find out what, this, what these three books are. We're talking about the nature of the judgment. See, the Adventists didn't notice at the time. They thought the judgment just, he has come and everybody's destroyed. But ah, God's so fair. What has to happen first? Before you can execute, there has to be a sentencing. And before there's a sentencing, during a thousand years, there has to be a what? An investigation. And so in 1844, it started the investigative judgment. So now, the, in the best of judgment, what has to happen is increase, search has to be made, and the books of records are opened up. Well, what are these books of record about? Go in your Bible, Revelation chapter 20, and let's see what these three types of, of, of record is in Revelation uh, chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Uh, let's see what the Bible says, beginning in verse 12. Uh, Sister Shirley, if you can read that for us, please. Revelation 20, verse 12, please. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. They weren't sitting, they were what? Standing before God. And what happens? And the books were open. Oh, the books were open. Not book, but the books were open. Let's continue. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. Ah, wait a minute now. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. Continue. And the dead were judged. The dead were judged. So in the judgment, it began to tell us about these three books. Now, question. One of those books, it gave us a name for it. What was the book called? The Book of Life. So the very first book we have here is the Book of Life. And the Bible connects it with the judgment. Am I right? Right. So that's the Book of Life. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Then it says, there's the Book of Life. But before it said the Book of Life, it says, and the book. Books. That meant, the what is the least amount of numbers you can have and say books? Two. 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 So the Bible says the Book of Life and books are going to be used in the judgment. So we need the name of the other two books, right? Right. And we'll see what else. So number one, Book of Life. Does the Bible anywhere else talk about the Book of Life? You know, in Daniel speaks of the Book of Life. Those who go through the time of trouble, their names are written in the book. Those who wander after the beast, it's whose names are not written in the Book of Life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So it's the Book of Life of the Lamb. It's the Lamb's Book of what? Life. That's the Lamb's Book. And anyone in that book must accept him who is the way, the truth. And, and the life. life. Jesus is your life. Yeah. That when he shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. When Christ, who is your life. So if we accept Jesus, our name is entered into the what? The life. You see why the devil don't want you to accept Jesus? Why he don't want me to accept Jesus? Mm -hmm. Now, does the Bible speak of this? So go, go in your Bible quickly to Philipp Philippians, uh, Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. The disciples got excited one day. You want to flip this for The disciples got excited one day and they said, Look, the devils were subject to us. We're excited, Lord. And Jesus said, Don't get excited about that. I saw Satan drop down to heaven like lightning. He said, But be happy about this. Your names are written in heaven. Now look what the Bible says. 
in Philippians chapter 4, and we want to look, Sister Debbie, at verse 3. Philippians 4 and verse 3. What is the Bible saying in verse 3, please? And I entreat thee also, true yoke Now, what is a yoke? What is a yoke for? Not, not, we're not talking about the, the yoke of an egg. It's talking, about, it's talking about you put on the animal so he can do what? Work. Work. So he's saying, my fellow workers. Would you read that again? And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. Praise the Lord. With Clintus also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the, the book, book, book of life. life. See, you see, all through the Bible, we don't even know what it's about. So God, when we begin to work with God as soul winners, as missionaries, as followers, fellow laborers with God, and accept Jesus, our names are written in the what? Book of life. What if I don't accept Jesus? No. What if I don't work for Jesus as a soul winner? Not in this book. But that's one book. Is there another book? Yes. Books. Go to Malachi. Go to Malachi chapter 3. There's another book. Malachi chapter 3, the last book of the New Testament, uh, Old Testament, excuse me. Malachi chapter 3. And let's see if we can find the name of another book. The Bible speaks of these books all throughout, but sometimes it gives the names. And Malachi 3, verse 16. Would you read that for us, Amaya? Malachi 3 and verse 16. Please. Malachi 3, verse 16. We're trying to find the name of another one of these books. Malachi 3, verse 16. What does it say, please? Then they that fear the Lord. Is this good people or bad people? Good. Good people. Fearing the Lord, all right? Speak often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of. And a book of. Of remembrance. Was what? Written. For him. For them that. Now remember, fear God mm -hmm. and get glory to Him. You have a game now? Okay, that's what you But So the book of what? Remember. Mm -hmm. So we have, I'm going to put that in the third slot. So we have a book of what? Remembrance. Now what is in the book of remembrance? Now, what is in the book of remembrance? Think about what it says now. It those says, that fear. for those who do what? Fear, fear the Lord. So what do you think that would be? What do you think, what do you think are being remembered in the, in the book of remembrance? Like good deeds. Our good deeds. That's it. That's what, that was the exact word. You know the name good works? Everything, anything we've done. Let me give you another text. Go to Nehemiah. Now that you know what the name of the book is, now I'm going to show you something that he says to do, and then we'll know what book it goes to. Go to Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah 13. All throughout the Bible you see sanctuary language, but you don't know it unless you understand the language. Now go to Nehemiah 13, and notice what it says. Because every verse in the Bible is trying to unfold to us the plan of redemption, redemption as revealed in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, notice Nehemiah 13. Notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 14. Right? Nehemiah 13 and verse 14. And tell me what the first word is in Nehemiah 13. We'll read this together. Nehemiah 13, verse 14. What's the first word? Remember. Right, so what, what, which book do you think this, this is going to be talking about? The what book of Remembrance. Right, let's read. He says, Remember me what? Oh, oh my God. God, concerning this, and wipe not out my. What did everybody make? Good deeds. You said that? You didn't make this up? This is in the Bible? It's in the Bible. Wipe not out my good deeds. That what? That I am done. That I am done for the house of my God and for the office thereof. So the book of remembrance remembers and records what? It records, it's a book of record, all of the good deeds that man has committed. Mm. You know that right sometimes you do something good and nobody knows about it. You cut the grass, you put the windows in, you up when nobody's here, you make sure everything is good, you cook for the family, you cook for the husband, you cook for the wife, you take care of the family members. I mean, you do many things, and sometimes you go on. No, no. Sometimes you have a list of doing a hundred things, and the person, I don't even know you did it. And you're thinking, man, would somebody say anything? But Jesus didn't think like that. Jesus doesn't. doesn't care what people say to him. Yes. But guess what? God does not forget. Amen. He will even, even the cry, the tear that you cried when you were praying and trying to help, but it didn't work out right, but you still tried. You didn't give up on your family. You didn't give up on this. And you cried. All those tears he puts in the body. Amen. He remembers it. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. You never go through anything. You never do anything for God that he does, that he does not remember. And he's going to bring it back in the judgment and say, look, devil. Look, father. Look at this. Remember this. 
Remember this. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Yeah. You know what I want to do? I want to do some more good things on the heart. So you can learn. Let, 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 let's give them some more to work with. <laughs> but remember, no matter how much good deeds we do, they can never earn a, a name here. No, that's right. That's not that book. You can do all these good deeds and still not have a name right there. Mm -hmm. We want our name in the book of life and we want those deeds there. But then there is a third. Y'all try to make me forget. <laughs> There's a third and a final book, which we call the second book. What is the book? What is, that, what is that third book? The third one we're talking about. Another name. Let's go in our Bibles to Isaiah 65. Let's go to Isaiah 65. I'm not going to tell you. I don't think I'm going to tell you the name. I'm going to see if you can tell me. Go to Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. And we want to read in Isaiah 65 slowly. You've got to put this together now. And we'll start in verse 6. Isaiah 65, verse 6. All right, Brother Smoke, verse 6, please. Isaiah 65, and verse 6. Isaiah 65, 6. Behold, it is written before me. In other words, it's in a book. It's written before me, right? That's what we have in the book, the writings. Let's see what is there. What's there? I will not keep silent, but will recompense. Even recompense into their bosom. In other words, it's going to be put against you. Your iniquity. Stop. Your iniquity. So what is written your before God? Your iniquity. So, what do you think is the third book that's going to be in our slot number two? Book of Iniquities. Book of Iniquity. Mm. Exactly right. Bad book. Yeah. The book of Iniquity. Give me another name for Iniquity. Sin. Sin. I'm going to give you another name for the book then. The wages of sin is death. So what is this book? The book of the book death. Of death. Yeah, book oh, of dear. Death. So we have the book of life, mm. the book of death, or the book of iniquity, mm. and the book of remembrance. Mm. Now, your name cannot remain in these two books. They're opposites. Either your name is going to be in the book of life or it's going to be in the book of death. You can't keep your name in both the book of life and the book of death. Okay. And the judgment will either clear your name out of the book of life or it will take your name out of the book of death. Amen. That's why the books have been open. Mm -hmm. And when the books open, we have our name and then we have everything that we've done. All of our works. All of our deeds. Good and bad. That's why the wise men said, with every secret thing, whether it be good, mm -hmm. book of remembrance. Whether it be bad, book of death. Mm -hmm. and you know that if we understood this, there's a lot of things we couldn't do. You know, sometimes we sneak around and we do something, we eat something we shouldn't do, we watch something we shouldn't watch, we, we say something we shouldn't say, and we sneak around and we say, well, nobody saw us sitting in the blackest of night, darkness. Nobody knows about it. But guess what? An angel is on. Recording. That's right. How much do you need right now? Everything. Everything. That's true. Mm -hmm. And we can pretend to each other, but in the judgment, it's cataloged. You know there's a date and a time by every act that we've ever committed. That's right. Everybody. And if we don't go to Jesus to get forgiveness, and to get cleansed and to get those sins not only covered, but what? But light. Wow. That's the cleansing of the sanctuary. Unless that happens, the sin of the cleansing of the sanctuary is the removal of sin from the books of what? Records. This is the cleansing of the sanctuary. But you're going to find out that the, the record can't change unless something else changes. Now, I can't explain it today. Another time we'll come back and explain it because this deserves a whole study. But I'm going to tell you this. Okay. The bank, you have a bank account. Right. The, let's say, give me a bank that you bank. Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. Give me another bank. Uh, True Point. New people. New people. What's it? True Point. True Point. Okay, let's say you go to the bank. All of a sudden, they have a record of your account, right? Mm -hmm. And they say in the record, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're not with mine, but if it's y'all, you probably have millions of them. It's in my mind, maybe a couple, couple hundred thousand. Millions there, you know. So the, the, look at the account, it's all there. Millions of them. And then all of a sudden, you now want in your mind, hmm, I wonder if I can get $10,000 more. I know what I'll do. I'll just put in my record $10,000. You, you, nice, you, you, you might end up in trouble like that. They might take you off to prison. All you down and put you somewhere. You know, maybe the person going to counterfeit money or think it's counterfeit. But see, the, the books are record there. Now, Records are only changed because of what really happens. Mm -hmm. So what if now you look at your account and all of a sudden you look, oh no, 
hundred dollars left my account. You go to the record of accounts and you go to the bank and say, look, a hundred dollars left my account. And then the man who's intelligent man, you know what he says to you? And you look at it and say, no. Uh, did you go to the store today? And you say, yes, I went to the store. How much money did you use? A hundred dollars. <laughs> what, 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 what did we say? You know, that, that's, that's why I did. that the book of records is only a reflection of how you live. If money comes out of the account, it's because of the way you lived, it just recorded it. Mm-hmm. Are you following me? Mm-hmm. So the book of records is an accurate account of what we think and do and motives. Mm, right. In order to change the record, then, guess what that has to change? Our, 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 our thoughts, our motives. Mm-hmm. He has to make a radical change in me. me. There was a story of a boy. He didn't like the temperature <laughs> outside. It was too uh, hot for him. You know, the old thermometers have the mercury in it. The red goes up to 100 degrees. He's, it's too hot outside. It's too hot outside. Then he thought for a moment, ah, I know what I do. I'll change the temperature. Yeah. How do you think I'm going to do that? He said, well, Mother always tells me, you know, you go in there, the, 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 the temperature right there is recorded there. And then when it's cold, the temperature, it, it records that. I know what I'll do. I'll change the temperature. So he grabs the thermometer and throws it down, and the mercury comes out, and the temperature goes down. <laughs> <laughs> the record of the temperature changed. Did the temperature change? No, no, no. Why not? You can't the mere changing of records do not can change the condition. Mm-hmm. It used to be, the, the used to be, they used to do progress reports. I don't know if they still do them today. Where the student goes to school and before the grades come out, in between, yes. there's a little progress. And I remember having some friends that were very mischievous. I never did it. I thought my parents were too intelligent for that. But, <laughs> but, but these, these, other, these other young boys, they were, they were very mischievous on this and this way. And they would sometimes get F's from not paying attention, but they had a way oh, of changing the F to make it look like a very strange A. <laughs> <laughs> and all you had to do, you, you, you know what they did? They put a little leg, and they They said, look, I got an A. And some father and mother would be like, you did good. Well, <laughs> next your question. Did the mere changing of the record from an F to an A make the child any more uh, any more intelligent? No. So the mere changing of records do not change us. Mm-hmm. So if the cleansing of the sanctuary is the cleansing of the records, it would not mean anything unless while he's cleansing the records up there, mm-hmm. he's doing what? Cleansing me. Changing the life where? Yeah. Yeah. So in the time of judgment, just before Jesus comes, there's to be a revival and reformation that has never been seen before. Mm. Change is being made down here because changes is being made where? Up there. And what if we're not willing to let God change the record by letting him change us? What if we're not willing? We're going to be messing up. Our names would have to be blotted out of the book of life. Mm. One or the other. Either he must take sin out of our lives and the record or you must take us mm-hmm. out of the book of life. Oh dear. But either way, the sanctuary will be cleansed. I want him to clean me up. I don't want him to clean me out. Oh, no. No, you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Now, let's be ready to bring it to a close. Let's be ready to bring it to a close. We see something better in the nature of the judgment. Mm-hmm. We see it involves these books of record. We see that they're judged by something. Do you know what the standard of the judgment is? The Bible says, so speak and do as they that shall be judged by the law. law. So what does God compare the record with? The The law. law. So how could the law be done away with if that's what's used in the judgment? It's not. The judgment is the last thing that happens. Mm -hmm. It's the law that's in the most holy place, the room of judgment. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is why the prophet says, let's read this together, Evangelism 2.22, as a people, we should be earnest students of what? Prophecy. Prophecy. We should not rest until we become what? Intelligent. Intelligent. And regard to the subject of the sanctuary, sanctuary, which is brought out in the visions of Daniel, Daniel and John. John. This subject sheds what? Great, Great light on our present position. And what? Word. The cleansing of the sanctuary means that while God is cleansing the record, we have to work with him and clean up our what? Showing, it says, it says uh, 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 for the work, and gives us unmistakable proof that God has led us in our what? Past experience. 
It explains our disappointment. Why are we disappointed? Because we didn't know the nature of the what? Judgment. We thought the judgment was just he was coming and punishing the wicked. Right. But he can't do that. Uh -uh. He's fair. He's just. There must be an investigation. Amen. So now the reason why we're disappointed, he came, but he did not come to the earth for the punishment. Guess where he came? He came. Watch what this is. It explains that this point in 1844, showing us that the sanctuary to be cleansed was what? Not, Not the earth, earth, as we had supposed, but that Christ entered into the most, most holy apartment, apartment, apartment of the heavenly sanctuary, sanctuary and is there performing the closing work of his priesthood and fulfillment of the words of the angel of the prophet Daniel. Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Then the last thing is this judgment. We saw that the Day of Atonement was a type. The typical Day of Atonement was a type of a Day of Judgment in which there was investigation, books were open, eternal destiny was decided. We saw that. We saw the nature of this judgment. We saw the books open up. We saw that every one of us were going to understand the living and the dead. And that tells me something. What text above all others formed the foundation of the Advent faith? What text? Daniel 8.14. What is another name for the cleansing of the sanctuary? Investigative. Yeah. Investigative judgment and uh, because judgment by itself does not clean the sanctuary. Right. The blind out of sin. The blind out of sin is the cleansing of the sanctuary. That's what it is. But you cannot block sins out until they have been what? Investigated. Investigated. So you will find out that what does it mean to cleanse the sanctuary? What does it mean to cleanse the sanctuary? You take soap and wash then wash heaven? No. No, no. It's cleaning and uh, removing what? Sin. Sin from where? From the book of book. From the records. Books of record that is in heaven. Now, how do we know the books are not on earth? Um, how do we know the books of record are in heaven? It says the temple is open. That the books are record in heaven? Well, because the ancient of days is in heaven. Well, how do you know that? Daniel. Daniel, where? Seven. All right, where in seven? <laughs> you got to be hard with it, you know? <laughs> A good student, good student. Daniel 7, 9. What did, what did it say happen? Well, that's where God's throne is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, good, that's, that's a good point. You got God's throne in heaven. The Bible says that. That's good. I, I said that. I said that. He, she, 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 she squeezed that. We're going to wear that thing. We're going to wear it around. But we're giving it up. The throne is in the Bible. Says the throne is in heaven. Now go to Job 16. We'll come back here. Go to Job 16. Go to Job 16. But you know, but even if we didn't know, God didn't condemn us. You know, this is the class for us to understand. In Job 16, look what it says in Job 16. Job 16, look what the Bible says in Job 16, beginning in verse 18. Job 16, verse 18. Uh, would you read that for us today? It's Job 16, verse 18, please. O earth, cover not thou my blood. So that's the earth. Earth, cover thou not my blood. Continue. And let my cry have no place. Verse 19. Also now, here. behold, my witness, my is, witness, witness is, is in heaven, and my record is on heart. You know, you're following this. We're following Everything we believe is where? In the Bible. Sunday Adventism is the religion of the Bible. Mm. It's a wonderful thing to be a seven Adventist where everything we believe comes from the Word of God. Where's the books of record? Talk to me. In, in heaven. heaven. Where's the days? In, in heaven. heaven. Where's the throne? In, in heaven. heaven. So when Jesus came, watch now, let's go, let's go down here. Let's put this together as we close. Come on now. Now this is good. My, my blood's flowing, brothers and sisters. Come on. Let me speak yourself. Go to Daniel 7 chapter. Can you remember when the Apostle Paul, he preached at midnight? <laughs> good then, don't, don't be afraid. I'm not going to preach at midnight. <laughs> Daniel 7. Daniel 7, look what it says. Now, Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10 shows the wheels of the Father coming in judgment. What do wheels do? What, why do you put wheels on the stuff? So, so what is that denoting? That when that when the ancient days sat down, the thrones were placed, that meant it had just been what? Wheeled in. It had just been what? Moved in for the opening of the... Now, nobody else has seen but the witnesses. It says thousands ministered to them. Who are these thousands? Angels. The ministering spirits. The angels. That brought the Father in. But guess what happens now? Now the scene changes. Daniel said it. Verse 13, verse uh, after 9 and 10, it says the opening of the judgment, the books are open. Then it says in verse 13, let's read verse 13 together. It says, I, I saw, saw in, in the, the night vision, and behold, one, one like, like the, the Son of God. Who's going to talk to me? Jesus. Jesus. What's the next word? King. Did he come? Yes or no? Yes. He came. He came. 
But where did he come? Look what it says. He came where? With the clouds Now, the early Adventists read that and said, well, that's just second coming. He's in the clouds of heaven. But watch what it says. And came with the clouds of heaven and came not to the earth, but where? To the ancient of so where was the ancient of days? With the books of records. Where was the book of records? In heaven. So where did Jesus come to? Not to the earth. He came to the ancient of days in heaven. He moved from the holy place into the what? Most holy place for the hour of judgment. Amen. So if we found out when the hour of judgment came, we would know when Jesus went into the ancient of days to receive his kingdom after the investigative judgment and the blotting out of sin is complete. And then the harvest, the coming of the Lord. The end of the world. Now you told me that all that was based on one verse. The basis of it. What was the verse? Daniel 8.14. Let's take these last five minutes and close on. Let's take these last five minutes and close. This should be reviewed to you. These last five minutes and close. This should be reviewed to you. We found out, is there a relationship between the 20 years day prophecy and the coming of Christ and the end of the world? Yes or no? Yes. yes. We found the 20 years day prophecy takes us to the beginning of judgment. The judgment is the last thing that happens. That after the blotting out of sin, Jesus is sent from heaven. We studied that. We found out this. I can't go through that right now. We found out those things. We, we went through that. Then we found out in the earthly sanctuary that God gave us a type of, or an example of the heavenly sanctuary and the services. What day was the sanctuary cleansed? What was the day called? The Day of Atonement. What was the date of the Day of Atonement? The 10th day of the seven months. Good. What event gave assurance that there will be a worldwide day of judgment on time? The resurrection. the resurrection. Good. When the hour of judgment was to begin, what special message would be given to the world? The three, three angels. angels' message, but it would start with the, the hour. first angel's message, which announces the hour of judgment. First angel. What text shows the time of the opening of the judgment? Daniel, Daniel 8, 14. Which brings the view. The scripture above all others. Daniel 8, 14. This is what gives our identity, who we are, our history, our roots. It explains this. We found the day of judgment was this day, the day of atonement, October 22nd. Now, here in the vision, how many parts of this vision? Four. Four, four great parts. Remember that? Yes. What were the four great parts? Give me the first part. The ram. Uh, the, the ram. Come on. Part of the what? What's the first part? The ram. The ram. ram. We read that in Daniel 8. What's the second part? The eagle. The eagle. eagle. What's the third part? The little horn. Who is the little horn? Rome. 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 The little horn is Rome. It starts off. Can you see that? <laughs> that's a very small little. That's the little horn right there. That's why it's called little horn. We found this out. This is the little horn. Now the Bible tells us what it is. Go to John 11. Let's go there quick. John 11. We have three minutes. Let's go quick. John 11. John 11. The Bible says in John 11. Look what the Bible says. In John 11, beginning in verse 47. After Greece, we found the Bible talked about the Persia, the ram. It spoke of Greece, the ego. The little horn is iron, Alexander the Great, his four generals, it, to the four parts of the earth, and then we saw his kingdom divided, and then it says a little horn came up after this. Well, his, history bears out who came after Greece. John 11 is going to tell us exactly who it is, because that was the power that was there when Jesus was killed. Mm -hmm. John 11, look what the Bible says in the beginning, we'll read this together. John 11, verse 48. What does the Bible say in verse 48? If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Roman shall come and take away both our place and our kingdom. Who is in control after Greece? The Rome. So we find that the little horn is none other than what? Rome. And the history bears out. Watch what the history says. They went to the south, to the east, to the pleasant land, like Daniel said. And just like it says here, it says, Time has seen the rise and fall of empires. It goes down. History has demonstrated that one of the many reasons for this ultimate decline was the, was the empire size. It says one of the greatest of these empires was, of course, the Roman Empire. Over the centuries, it grew from a small Italian state. What does it sound like? A what? Little horn. To control land throughout Europe, across the Balkans, to the Middle East, and North Africa. Again, just like the Bible says, it conquered the south. What's south of Italy? What's south of Italy? Africa. Africa. What's east of Italy? Asia. Asia. Mm. So, just like the Bible said, it did that very thing. Now, the vision had three parts. We spoke of the three parts. With the ram, first part. Second part is? Uh, Eagle. Third part is? Little Horn. horn. Media, Persia, Greece, Rome. And then we saw the last part was the time that would lead to the cleansing of the century. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Uh, what is the relationship between the cleansing of the sanctuary and the day of judgment? When was the sanctuary cleansed? Yeah. On the day of judgment. judgment. Atonement. Yes. And what was, it was done on the day of atonement? It was the day of judgment. judgment. So the cleansing of the sanctuary was the day of judgment. judgment. So we can see that if we can find out when the sanctuary was cleansed, we can find out when the opening of the day of the judgment began. Does it make sense? Yes. So we studied that. Now, we in Miller and others, when they studied that, they knew that, but they could not find one point. You know what they couldn't find? The, the beginning starting point. Point. Mm -hmm. If you can start the 20 or days, then you can know when it ends. And then you would have the day of the opening of the judgment. Now, question. Was it 2,300 literal days or 2,300 symbolic days? Symbolic. The ram, literal or symbolic? Symbolic. The eagle, literal or symbolic? Symbolic. symbolic. The little horn, literal or symbolic? symbolic? So then the time, literal or symbolic? Symbolic. symbolic. So what is a day represented by Bible prophecy? A year. We went through these steps. Yeah. So 2,300 days means 2,300 what? Years. We looked at this. Very good. So we found 2,300 years. Now, all we need to know then, when is that starting point of the 2,300 day prophecy? Because then we would know the opening of the judgment and why the disappointment, and we can bring it to a close. Now, so we need, you, you're walking me through this, because you, we study this now, this is you walking me through and review as we close. So as we go to Daniel uh, uh, 8, we found out at the end of Daniel 8, Daniel didn't understand. At the beginning of chapter 10, Daniel understands. Understand. So then when did his understanding come? Chapter 9. And that would be Daniel 9. If he didn't understand in chapter 8, and he does understand chapter 10, then the only instruction came in Daniel what? 9. Nine. So then, where will we find the understanding of the 29 day prophecy as it relates to time? Where will we go? Daniel 9. So we go to Daniel 9. And when he comes back, if we're right, the first thing we would expect Gabriel to explain was the understanding of time because he explained the, the, the ram, he explained the eagle, he explained the little horn, but he did not explain the 29 days, right? Right. And so, when he comes back in Daniel 9, where does he begin? Does he begin with the ram? No, no. no. Where does it begin? Time. In Daniel 9, look what he says in verse 23. In Daniel 9, verse 23, uh, uh, it says, At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am come to thee, for thou art greatly what? Beloved. Therefore, what's the next word? Understand, Understand the matter and what? Consider. He goes back to the vision. Verse 24. Where did he start? Time. He's explaining the time. Now he says what? Talk to me. He says, are determined. he says, 70 weeks are what? Determined. Now we found out what that word means. What does that word mean? Talk to Cut me. off. We found that word determined comes from the Hebrew word shatak. What does it mean? Cut to off. cut off. So then it says, 70 what? Weeks are what? Cut off. 70 weeks are cut off. They're what? Cut off. Uh, here's our 70 weeks span. We'll come back to that in this moment. 70 weeks are cut off. Cut off of what? The 2300 days. Well, the only prophecy of the vision he was talking about. Right. The longer prophecy. Now, 70 weeks is prophetic. In order to get how literal time this is, you had to turn weeks into a day. How many days in a week? Seven. seven. So in order to get how many days in this, 70 times 7 equals what? Four. Four. So 490 days and seven, 490 days and 70 weeks and we know that a day represents a yeah. year. So 490 years is what the 70 week prophecy talked about that was given to who? 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. people and the Holy City. So for Jews in Jerusalem, they had 70 weeks. Mm -hmm. 490 years. years. And then the limit. And their probation would be closed as God's chosen people. Now. Of that 70 weeks, God said, I'm going to make sure you understand this. So I'm going to give you time periods in between to make sure that you're counting right. If you just told a child to count to a billion, you think they might get lost somewhere? <laughs> so then what would you have to do? Have some checkpoints. You ever been counting money and you counting $10, $30, $10. Now you might be doing 20, 50, 100, you know, but, but you count that money. All of a sudden in the middle of it, you forget. Ah, did I count that one already? And then your mind gets. So God gives us little checkpoints. So now inside the seven week prophecy, he didn't want us to miss this because this is the most wonderful prophecy telling us the first coming of Christ and what controls the second coming of Jesus. So notice what he says in verse 25. He breaks up the 70 weeks into parts that you can count and can check your answers to be sure and seal up the vision. And in verse 25 what's the first thing he says. No. Know therefore and understand that. What's the next word from? I would circle the word what from. What does from give me? 
If I said, I want you to go over there and count from there to here, what's my starting point? The from. from. So now we have a starting point for the 70 weeks. We're just cut off on the 2300 days. And that means we have a starting point for the 2300 days or the 2300 year prophecy. Now, what was the point that we had to start the counting from? Going forth of the commandment to restore and to what? So there would be a commandment here to restore and what else? Build. Now, why would they need to build Jerusalem if Solomon already built Jerusalem? Why would they need to build it again? How did it get destroyed? They were in apostasy. They transgressed law. They were scattered. And who came down? Nebuchadnezzar and broke down and burnt down the temple, took the Jews away, destroyed their walls, broke down the streets. They destroyed the city. But then 70 years, they'd been in Babylon, but then the command would be given to go back to Jerusalem to restore Jerusalem and to build. Now, from that commandment to restore, there was going to come a point. From that commandment to restore and rebuild, there was going to be some time. Look at what it says. Go to the next verse. In verse uh, 25, continuing, excuse me. Verse 25, from the commandment, that's the starting point, to restore and to build Jerusalem unto what? The Messiah, the Prince, shall be what? Seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So we have seven weeks. Prophetic time. Three score. What is three score? Score is 20. Three score is what? Three score and two is what? 62. Now we're going to do something now. Watch what it says now. Three score, uh, three score and two. So seven weeks and three score and what? Two weeks. Now what is seven uh, what is we want to go there? What is seven plus sixty-two? Sixty-nine. So now we have sixty-nine weeks, but it's supposed to be a total of what? Seventy. So now what we have here is that first sixty-nine. Now why is it broken up into seven weeks and then three score and what? Two weeks. I put it over here. I put that. I push it. Put it right here. Three score and two weeks. Why is it broken up into two? Three score and two weeks because there was two events to check your prophecy by the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, but something was going to happen in between. In between here and the Messiah coming, the Bible says the temple that was supposed to be restored, it was going to be restored and re what? Built. So guess what? This first seven weeks, how many, how many days is that? How many weeks in, uh, in a day? How many days in a week? Seven. So seven times seven is what? Forty nine. So forty nine uh, uh, days is seven weeks. But a day equals a year. So then forty nine years. Something was to happen in 49 years. Guess what was supposed to happen within the 49 years? The temple was to be rebuilt. And the wall and the street was to be what? Restored. So the first part of the seven weeks was to take us to the rebuilding of, the, uh, of Jerusalem. And that happened. Then after that seven weeks had passed, there were 62 weeks later that would take us to the Messiah. So together, 69 weeks from the commandment to the Messiah broken up by the rebuilding of the temple. Does it make sense? Yes or no? Good. Question. Did it happen just like that? Because then the Bible says, what's going to happen next? Look what the Bible says. How much time is left after the street will be rebuilt and the wall in troublous times? How much time will be left after 69 if there's 70 weeks? How much time left? So we would have one week left to fill that 70 weeks. 69 plus one equals what? Seven. But one week has how many days? Seven. So how many days are how many years are really left? Seven years. Now in this last seven years, what's going to happen in that seven year period? Look at what it says in verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be what? So that Messiah that came after 69 weeks, he will be cut off in the last week after the 60 and two weeks, which takes us into the 70th week. Does it make sense? So the Messiah will be cut off after the temple was rebuilt, after the, he was anointed as Messiah, after the 60 week period, in that last week, the Messiah will be cut off. What does it mean to be cut off? We read that from the Bible. To be cut off means to die, to be destroyed. Zechariah, remember we read that cut off means to die. So that meant that somewhere in this last week, the Messiah would die. But we don't have to guess. Look at the next verse. Look at verse 27. It tells us when the Messiah would die. In verse 27, it says, and he shall conform, confirm the covenant with many. How long? For one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to what? 
Why were the sacrifices offered? They were pointing to the death. Of Jesus. So then what would cause it to be cut off? What would cause it to cease? What would cause it to stop? What it was pointing to, the death of Jesus. So the Messiah cut off would be in the midst of the week. What is the middle of seven? So that means that in the last week, where in the last week would Jesus die? In the middle of the week. So three and a half years after he was baptized, he would die on the cross and cut off. How much time will be left? Three and, a half. three and a half years. And at the end of that three and a half year period, then probation would close on what nation? The Jewish nation. Now, my brothers and sisters, did that happen? Yes. The only way to check it is to find out history. When did the commandment to restore Jerusalem go? And then we can lay it on the prophecy. We did it. When did, when did the commandment go forth? You know it. When did it go forth? We found out the starting point. We went through and we found out through the encyclopedia, the, one of the most trusted histories. By historians, it's considered to be what? Accurate. Accurate. Forms the backbone of all we commonly accept as chronology. It's called the Canon of Kings by Ptolemy. Well, let's see what he says. In the, in, in the Canon of Kings by Ptolemy, here is the Canon of the Kings. He tells us the most trusted history. Let's see if we can find Artaxerxes. What year? So he started his reign in what? 464. We read in Ezra 6 and 7 that it was in the seventh year that Artaxerxes gave the commandment. We read that in Ezra 7 and Ezra 6 and 7. What is the seventh year from 464? What's the seventh year? 463, 462, 461, 460, 459, 458, 457. So, so then from history, we know that the seventh year based on the Bible would have to be what? 450 what? We traced it. So now if we go then 49 years, we will get when the temple was rebuilt. If we go 69 uh, uh, weeks, as it were, which is really, how, how, how much time is that? Let's do that. Four, uh, if, we go, if we go to 69 times 7, because in the week, 69 weeks and 7, 9 times 7 is what? 63, good. 7 times 6? 42. No, 7 times 6, 42. 42 plus 6? 48. So if we go 483 years, it should take us to what? The anointing of the Messiah. And if you take, and all you do, remember 457 is BC, so you count down. So all you do is a minus, and let's put the minus and see what happens. 43. So we have 457. You can't take 7 from 3, so we have to get it from here, right? So if I take that bar that's 8, then what I have to turn this to? 7. Then what do I turn this to? 13. Now, 13 minus 7. That's right, six. Uh, seven minus five. So in 26 AD, I should look for Messiah. But remember, something that happens, that in the calendar, you don't have a zero year. So if I'm now counting from BC to, if I, if I was in one BC, and I say, go, go back one year to AD, would you take me to zero AD? No. So if I go from one BC, one, BC, one year backwards, it would take me to what? One, one AD. So you can notice that you have to add a zero when you cross, you had to add one when you cross from B.C. to A.D. Because there's no such thing as year what? Zero. zero. This is what we found out. Year zero does not exist in Anna Denomina, A.D. System usually used to number years and the so the year before one A.D. is designated this. So what you have to do is add what? One year. So if it's 26 moving from B.C. to A.D., then I should expect to see the Messiah not in 26 A.D., I should expect to see Messiah in what? 27 A.D. And what do we see in 27 A.D.? The Messiah. What's happening to him? He's been what? Baptized. He's been anointed. And the word Messiah means what? Anointed. Now a question. That fulfilled the prophecy. This is fulfilled. This is fulfilled. But remember, the same Messiah that's anointed in 27 A.D. is to be cut off in the midst of that next week. Three and a half years later. So if this is the fall of 27 AD, three and a half years later, it would take me where? Give me three years. 28, 29, 30. But remember now, that will be the, 30 is the fall of the year. So that'll be 30 fall. Now I need to add half a year, right? So if I add half a year, it'll take me back to the spring, which is the beginning of the next year. So it would take me then that the cross would be the spring or the beginning of 31 AD. Where did Jesus die? In the spring of 31 AD. Right on! 
Then we would expect to see Jesus, the same Messiah anointed baptized, who died in 31 AD. We would expect three and a half years later, something would happen that would cause the rejection of him to close the rejection on the Jewish nation. Did it happen? Yes or no? Yes. What happened? Stephen. The stoning of Stephen. Well, who, why, why did they stone Stephen? Because they didn't like Stephen? Who was he preaching about? Jesus. Jesus. He said Jesus was the Messiah that you killed. And so now they rejected Jesus through the person of Stephen. And what year was Stephen rejected? Let's see if we can find out what year Stephen was rejected and stoned. We'll pass all this. We look at this. We saw that. Here's Stephen, Stephen, Encyclopedia. St Stephanus, they called him. What he represented, his martyr. And look what it says. You can see that he was born about A.D. 5 and he died A.D. Can you see that? 34 as the first Christian martyr. So what year was that? Now, if I go from 31 AD to the spring, if I go three years later, what do I go to? 34. 34 but I got to put a half a year, so it's not 34 spring, half a year would take me back to the what? Fall. fall. So then Stephen goes down the fall 34 AD, right? right? That ends the probation for Jewish nation. God turns from the Jewish nation to the what? Gentiles. What year am I? 34 AD, right? But now, 490 years is cut off. I'm in 34 AD, fall. But 490 years. Now, we have 2300 days. That's what it's cut off from. So if I take 490 years from that, zero from zero is what? Zero. Can I take nine from zero? So what do I have to do? I got to borrow so I can make that that. Well, I got to borrow from here. What do I make that? Uh, uh, what do I make that? 12. Now, where do I get that 12? I got to take it from where? There's two. And I make that what? One. Now, pull it down. One is what? One. 12 minus 4 is what? 8. 10 minus 9 is what? And 0 is 0. What, how much time do I have left from the 2300 days? So after 34 AD, all this happened, 34 AD, I now need to add 1810 to 34 AD. So now that I take 34 AD. Did it happen on time? All this happened, right? What do I get when I add that? 4 plus 0 is what? 4. 3 plus 1 is what? 4. 8 plus nothing is what? Eight and one, nothing is what? One. Eighteen what? But what time of 1844? In the fall! Now listen, but that's not October 22nd. How do we get October 22nd, which is the fall? Now remember, 10 day, guess what? Just as when Jesus died on the cross in 31 AD, it was the 14th day of the first month, Abib. Do you know that in 1844, the 10th day of the seventh month was October 22nd, 1844. It happened on So Jesus went into the most holy place on But guess what? He's coming out on time. I want to stretch it, but my time is gone. I'm going to tell you something. What the Supreme Court Justice is doing right now, what this is about, we're going to show you it has something to do with Jesus not going into the sanctuary. It has something to do with telling us that he's finishing his work and he's getting ready to do what? But guess what? We're not ready. For Jesus to come out of the sanctuary means that we're through with sin in our lives. Every bit of worldliness, gone. Everything outside of the scripture, gone. I mean, one example. Let, let me show you what, what early Adventist song. We'll close right here. Let me, let me, let me dark this out, Brother Smokey. Just in case I get tempted. <laughs> now, let, let's close. Go to I, Isaiah. Let's go. Isaiah 66. I'm going to show you something as we close. Isaiah 66. Can you imagine the early Adventists studying this? And they're recognizing something. They recognize now the judgment meant that they could not live the way they were living. Do you know that they closed their business down and start praying more? They start having prayer meeting. They start studying their Bible. The children start making changes. Big screen television start being thrown out of the houses. Xboxes destroy. I mean, they say, look, judgment's coming. I mean, they, they got rid of, they, they, they're going to the refrigerator, throwing things out. Clothes, changing the clothes. They're making some radical changes. They say, look, we got to do something. Now look what the Bible says. Isaiah. And, and these days is a big thing. Man, I look big to you now, but this is big back in those days. Let me show you something. Isaiah 66. Look what the Bible says in verse, 55, uh, verse 15. Isaiah 6, 6, verse 15. All together, let's read together. It says, For behold, the Lord will come how? 
with fire. This is the coming of the Lord. They thought that this is how the second coming of Christ is going to be, and it will be this way, but they thought that was going to happen in 1844. Then it says what? And with chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and rebuke with what? Flames of fire. Verse 16. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be what? Verse 17. Let's read this together slowly. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves where? Behind one tree in the midst. What does it say? Eating what? Swine's flesh. What is a swine? What is swine's flesh called? What would we call it today? We may not call it swine's What would you call it today? Pork. It says, eating swine's flesh and the abomination of the mouth shall be what? In other words, if you're eating swine when Jesus comes, you're going to be burnt up. Can you imagine, can you imagine reading, if Jesus is coming and I'm eating pork, I'm lost. What do you think that man, if he believes the Bible says? Get rid of that side of me. Can you imagine? They were, they, were, they were pig farmers. I remember being in one country. The man came out to a meeting. He was a butcher. And he butchered pigs. That was his livelihood. He came to the meeting and read. You know what he said? I'm going to have to get a new job. Amen. Amen. And he did so. Now, do you understand? My teacher who taught me this. When he heard this message. He just bought a half side of hog meat. He was getting ready for the winter. They would buy the whole hog. Him and his friends split it up, put it in the fridge, cut it up. They, they had already cut it up, prepared for the entire winter. He said he loved that hog meat. And then he began to hear this message. You know what he said? No more. I love God more than anything else. Amen. Now for us, it may not be hog meat. But it's something. Yeah. What's in our life that is keeping us from a relationship with Jesus? It may be a television for somebody. It may be a radio for someone else. It may be some relationship. It doesn't matter what it is, but if you talk to God, God will put his finger on it. Yes. And we need to say, dear Lord, cleanse my heart yes. so that you can cleanse and blot out the sins from the record and come and take us home. Yes. I want to be ready. What do you say? Amen. If that's your desire, would you reverently pray with me as we conclude this morning? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your Holy Spirit. We're so thankful for the truth of the Bible that we can see clearly that on October 22nd, 1844, you began the work of judgment, but the first phase, the investigative judgment, the pre-avent judgment, and after this judgment is finished, you will come the second time to start the second phase of the judgment where we will be with you in heaven for a thousand years, making the sentence of what will happen to those who have not accepted you. We will see the books of record. And then the third and final phase will be the execution of hellfire. And when it is all destroyed, Eden lost will become Eden restored and a new heaven and a new earth. And we who love you can live with you forever. Lord, we want to be saved. We want to help others to be saved. And it starts by making the decision to let you clean out of us everything that would keep us from a relationship with you that is close and intimate and personal. I pause the prayer. Someone says, Lord, I want this week to look in my life and ask you to point out anything that needs to be removed and to give you strength to work with Jesus. Just raise your hand. Lord, I want strength to cleanse my heart and life. I want to be ready for the coming of the Lord. What's in your life that needs to come out? Just raise your hand wherever you are. Heavenly Father, you see the lifted hands. I'm lifting mine. I want us to be ready, Lord. Thank you for our family, church. Thank you for this beautiful opportunity that we've had today. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit, which is here. We don't want to leave you, dear God, but Lord, we don't have to. We can take you with us. So please keep us and save us and then use us to help many others for the hour of your judgment is come. We thank you in Jesus name. Amen. If you were blessed by this study and would like to be a part of the BTI that's Bible Training Institute, simply have your Bible pen and paper handy and check out our weekly studies by logging on to molministry.com. Hover over sermons, then from the drop down, click the word video. Also, tune in every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the latest. Maranatha.